we are back, folks, after a brief hiatus uh, here on the Michigan Insider Film Breakdown focused on the offense, and you've been asking for it. You've been saying, hey, can you get Al Borges and Devin Gardner together, together like they were on the field, together like they were in that quarterback room, in the full team meeting? What was it like when you had Devin and his very opinionated ways and Al Borges, in his very opinionated ways, how did that work out? We're going to find out today on this <laughs> film breakdown. Kevin, how are you today, man? I'm doing great. Uh, you know, Coach Borges always talked about having one last butt whooping for me. Uh, and, then, you know, he may use it on me. And, and and he scared me for sure, obviously. And that's why he brought all this snow. You know, it, it's that's that's really what it is. Well, I wasn't going to whip you. I was going to whip Denard because you're not Denard. He drives you out of your mind, you know. But I never did end up using it on Denard. <laughs> he always, he'd always chuck it and try moving away. I could, you know, I couldn't get to him. He's very, so, very bad. So since I just got one left, I might have to use it on you. I, we'll see how you do today. Al, how are you doing today, man? I do great. I do great. I was hoping Kevin would be in studio, but he's not in studio, and I got to look at him, you know, on the screen, which. <laughs> It's real pretty, but I'll do what I got to do. Well, you know, it's it's great to have, and it has been great to have your perspectives all season long. I mean, we had some thoughts about what the offense would be uh, at the beginning of the season. And then as it has evolved, I think that we have seen the entire offense grow, but I think we've witnessed the evolution of Josh Gaddis. And here's where I'm going with this at the, in the off season. He said, and Al, you remember I, I shared with you this conversation. I didn't stick with the run enough. Last year when he had a couple of quarterbacks that were new, that were green, he liked the talent, really felt like there were some, some things that could be unlocked in the pass game, in the throw game. And as they got into the season, a lot of those things were open. And he tried to keep hitting, even when the quarterbacks were inconsistent with hitting them or they didn't have necessarily have the protection Always, it, he kept calling him. He said, you know, if I had to do over again, I'd run the football more. We got into this season. The Washington game ran it down their throats. But really the test to me was the Wisconsin game. You Both of you guys will remember this because you detailed it. Both of you did. All the plays that were left on the field in the first quarter, first 17 minutes, it was like four touchdowns. Be very easy for an offensive coordinator to fall in love with his stuff and they keep calling out, I'm going to call 50 pass plays. He didn't do that, Al Borges. He ran the football, found a way to run the football, still threw it some, but stuck with that run and stuck with that run all season. Yeah, I, and that's what I thought the evolution of the offense was, is when we first started watching Michigan a couple years ago when Coach Gaddis got here, they were a lot of RPOs. They, they were doing a lot of what they wanted to do or what they did do at Alabama. And – uh as he's evolved more and kind of evaluated what he's got, a lot of the RPOs have gone away. Now, they're not gone. They're still, I don't know, five to seven, maybe as many as nine in a game, but nothing like it was. So what's happened is you're throwing, running into more loaded boxes and you're dependent more on your running backs than you're dependent on your quarterback, which for this group is probably the best approach. Now there's going to be ugly plays. You know, you're going to run some plays. You go, oh, God, there's too many bodies. I, I mean, Penn State, I mean, goodness gracious, <laughs> they had the water boy lined up inside uh, the box. But um, they just decided, and smartly so, in my opinion, anyway, that we're going to pound them. We're not going to, we're not going to bubble them. We're going to bully them. That was mm-hmm. how I we talked about a couple of weeks ago. We're not going to bubble them. We're going to bully them. And I think that was uh, the biggest change is taking the ball being less quarterback dependent and being more running back offensive line dependent. And Devin, it, one of the things that we've been talking about since the very first game is how you use two quarterbacks effectively without, without affecting your starter. And at the same time, growing your, your, your backup, your relief pitcher up in a way that that's functional, that helps you. That isn't just one play here, one play there. They got to the point where they give them multiple plays and you really could feel the contribution more of of uh, JJ McCarthy as the season went on, and as you said, hey, that this has the potential to make K better, not worse. Yeah, I mean, I, I I said that, and I was spot on. I mean, K played so much better because, like I always talked about, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you don't like K, you don't like K. It's not that I don't like K. 
I know the Kate is limited and I know that we need more to be able to win the things that, you know, Michigan wants to win. And so, uh, and I, but I also know he has pride, right? And so I thought that he, he's got a little butthole in him, right? You know, like you can tell by the way he walks around, the way he does his interviews, you know that he has some pride. And so I thought that for sure, if you, if you implant uh, uh, JJ, it's going to force him to play better because people are going to see how explosive, how talented, how amazing this kid is. And, and, and if you don't play well, you're going to be, you're going to be called to be sat down. You know what I mean? And so I think that he did a good job of playing well. And, and I think that JJ came in and played. I mean, I, I remember going in, you know, coach Borges with the deuce pack, package with me and Denard and, and, and going in and I'll, I, I would play well, but I didn't play nearly as well as this kid did in, in spot duty. You know what I mean? He's going in and making explosive plays and, and not perfect, but almost close to perfect in the way that he's, he's playing. And so uh, I thought that was really special, and and they need to continue to lean into that and not and not lean away from it. And so that is, I think, and I think we all agree, going to be one of the keys to to this game. My my partner on Sports Talk 1050 WTKA, Ira Weintraub, said the usage for J, for JJ McCarthy and Big Ten play was about somewhere between 10, 12 percent, right? And so in this game, though, against Georgia. You want to run the football like you always have, except this is the best front seven you have seen. And I don't necessarily think it's close. I mean, I, I wondered if they would see a better front seven than Wisconsin. Well, here you have it. How do you run on these guys? And it really feels like J.J. McCarthy is or could be a major element, Al. And I know we'll, we'll detail this coming up. But he could be a major element in them – figuring out a way to run on this defense. Yeah. And I mentioned this to you last week is I just think against these guys, you know, more than any team they played all year that this kid's got, got to probably play between 15 and 20, maybe even more to be able to run the football. Not that he's just in there to run the ball. Right. Cause I think, I think Dev would probably agree with this is JJ is closer to what they want as a quarterback to run the offense. I think Gaddis wants to run, but not quite ready to do it yet. I think I think that's how they justify it, and rightfully so. But in this game, just going back through, I went over every game now. I've seen every game they played so far. Talking about and, Georgia, yeah. And there's a vulnerability to quarterback runs that they need to run on. Now they're not easy to run on. There's a, and there are some runs you can run that aren't quarterback runs, so it's not totally. It's not all quarterback runs, but to make this thing go and to present more issues for them defensively, you're going to need some quarterback runs. And this kid's the best equipped to do it. Plus, he's not a guy you can just say is going to be a quarterback. It's going to be a quarterback run, and there's no threat of pass because he can bring to the table a lot, all the same things that the starting quarterback can add the quarterback run. So a team that's that stout defensively needs to be attacked at every spot they look vulnerable, and they don't have a lot of vulnerable spots. So I think in this game, uh, there's a spot for this kid to play more than he's played all year if you want to run the football with the type of effectiveness that they have to this point. Yeah, they're very stout on the interior, and then they have fast-flow linebackers. I think I think one of the coaches compared N'Kobe Dean to, to Devin Bush. I don't think that's far off with when you talk about their style, their speed the explosiveness, and you sort of just made a reference to it, Devin, just in your experience, the, the difference when you stepped on the field in Big Ten play compared to when you stepped on the field versus South Carolina. So I, I want to take a moment, take a beat, to sort of talk about the SEC perception that they are just so much more, so much faster, so much more explosive that Michigan is going to feel like they're running in quicksand when they play a team from the SEC. Mind you, Michigan has beaten SEC teams in bowl games, mostly Florida. Uh, but was it really, was the difference, at least in your experience, Devin, was it really that stark? Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's not, so it, it's hard to explain just because, like, when you play a, a, a Big Ten team or a MAC team and, and whatever, it's levels to everything, I think, you know, and, and but the thing is, you're ready for that level, but you don't know what level it is, I think, is it, more of the, the case and so you play a, you play a Mac team right you play Akron or you play Eastern Michigan or whatever 
and you're pretty much doing whatever you want, right? You can just run around. You can jog around. Coach Borges can call what he wants. It'll work. You know what I mean? We can mess around. We'll be able to come back and beat him. And then you go to a Big Ten game or, or Notre Dame, for example, right? So we, we played against, I think, Central Michigan in, in, in uh, 2013, and then we played against Notre Dame, right? That beginning of that Notre Dame game, I had to get reacclimated to the speed of, of almost real football. You know what I mean? Where I'm talking about they were knocking the crap out of me. I got hit every single throw, I think, Coach Boards in the beginning of that game. Yeah. Every yeah. single throw. Every single throw, they knocked me on the ground, and, and, it, and it did not feel good, right? <laughs> and so when you go from there, and then when we went to the bowl game in 2012 against um, South Carolina – the beginning of that game, it almost took me the whole first quarter. I don't know, Coach Boyd, maybe you could agree with it. It took me the whole first quarter to get acclimated to how fast they were playing, right, as far as their DBs and coverage, their linebackers flowing to when I'm running around. Oh, I mean, everything was so much faster. But after the first quarter, I was perfectly fine, right? So I was fully capable, and we were fully capable. But it's something that you're just not used to just because they are faster. They do have a lot of speed, you know what I mean? And then we're playing on this slippery – Tampa Bay football field. I don't know why it's so slippery. It's supposed to be grass. I don't know. Did the art kept slipping all over the place? But it, it, I think the speed is different. But you can get ready for it. You can be ready for it. It's not like we're not fast enough. It's just that they play in that same speed every single week. No matter the weak teams, the good teams in the SEC, they're all fast, and you have to kind of get ready for that. Yeah, he wasn't bothered. You weren't bothered by their schemes. There's you yeah. were you were fine. The comfort level in terms of how the plan worked. He was good from the beginning, but you got to get adjusted. You instead, you know, you one week you're playing against a guy at defensive end that's probably going to be selling groceries next year, right. and the next week you're playing against Clowney. You know what I mean? Right. That 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 takes some adjusting. Their safeties and corners are faster. Everything, everything is different. You know, it's like the game got sped up. But in terms of understanding, you know, he he had no issues to me anyway in that game of of figuring out where to go with the ball. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Most of all, all his decision making was pretty good. And you you improved. It's not like they they ran you down every time. Yeah, I mean, a lot of guys. The the rude awakening when you get into some of these games is you can't make the improv plays that you made in other games because these guys yeah. really find out the NFL mm-hmm. because the guys that are playmakers in college can't make it in the NFL because they can't make the improv plays as often. But I didn't see any issues with that. So I think he hit it on the head. It takes a while. To, you could dip your toe in the water before you dive into the pool, you know, and when you get into like the second quarter and you realize it goes, I, I'm, I, I'm fine. Athletically, I'm fine. So Do you think this team, look at how they finished though. They finished dominating Ohio state and blowing the doors off Iowa. And those are two good football teams. Now they're clearly not the defensive team that Georgia is, but you know, I mean, they, they've been ascending. I mean, they, they haven't peaked yet. You, you almost feel like they haven't peaked yet. Like they still have another level to get to as they head into this, this to this Georgia game. Does it does that matter when you talk about how they finish the season heading into this game? Well, I think uh, Ohio State isn't as good as Georgia up right. front. Mm-hmm. Now, the front seven, they're not as good. Georgia's stout. Mm-hmm. But uh, in terms of total team speed, I, I'm not. I'm betting Ohio State is as fast as Georgia yeah. I, or close to it. I mean, but I just feel like Georgia's – so hard, you know, to move off the ball. That that's where I think the biggest difference is. But in answering your question, I think, and I'm, I'm curious to see what Devin says about this. I think Michigan at this point is playing better than they've played all year mm-hmm. against good opponents. You know, you could say, well, oh, they ran up 500 yards, and then say it's against somebody that won three games. No, they just beat Ohio State handily. Okay, you could say it was what I don't know what the final score was. But that was an ass kicking, You're right? Okay. Uh, once they got settled in against uh, against Iowa, that was a game. that wasn't a game. So yeah. uh, I'm not saying Georgia's not better than those teams. They might be. I'm not 100 percent sure they're better than Ohio State. And I'll say that. And that that might be a bold statement. I don't but, think it's a bold statement. No, but but I think they're just playing better than they've played all year. They're ready to play this game, right, Devin? I yeah. mean, I yeah, mean, I think if it's the middle of the year. I would not feel good about this game. But yeah, I think I think they're definitely ready because they know exactly who they are, right? They know exactly who they are. They know exactly what they can do, and 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 I think people are still forgetting. I think this will play to the advantage of Michigan. They are fast, <laughs> right? Their defense is fast, and their offense is fast. The only person who's not fast is Kay McNamara. He's not fast. It's fine, right? But the most of the team, the team speed, even when you watch their guards pull 
or or the you know running backs in the hole. Every they are fast. They have really good speed, and so I don't think I think that they just have to get used to playing against other another team with really good speed, right? It, you know, they they blasted Ohio State, but the thing is, I I, I kind of found and learned, uh, and and I think this this is for the next level too, right? Like like Coach Borges said. You're not playing against anybody that's bagging groceries. You know what I mean? Uh, some of these guys are going to play at the next level and, and play well. Um, they 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 are a little bit faster, but it's not it's not completely all that they're just faster. I think that the schemes that the SEC plays allows for their players to think faster and and not essentially not have to think so that they can get to spots and play their schemes faster. Right, and so they are they have a little bit more speed, but I think it's more of they can play faster because they're not thinking. Right. And, and I think that in the SEC, they really figured that out because they've got so much talent. Right. We've got so much talent. Why would we have our guys thinking when we're faster already? Right. So they can just fly around with their hair on fire. And I think that's where Georgia and I think that's where we're going to get a bit of an advantage just because of the, the comple- complexity of the way that Gaddis does the run game and, and the different things that he implements into the game plan. And it's going to make them think. Right. And so if they haven't thought all year and, and Alabama made them think a little bit. Uh, that's going to be a problem for them, I think, uh, going into this game. And like you said, quarterback runs, that, that's the one thing I outlined early in the year when I said, hey, Georgia's not going to be Alabama, period. I, like, I was very, very strong in saying that. And it's because of the quarterback and his ability to get out of the pocket and to run. Alabama was arrogant. They played two-man against Bryce Young because Bryce Young hadn't showed that he can run all year, even though everybody knows he's a talented runner. For modern day, he just hadn't shown it. And they had the audacity to play two-man against the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback who is a talented special runner, right? And so if they if they play two-man against Bryce Young, I can all but guarantee they will play two-man against Kay McNamara, right? And so he has to be in a position where he can take advantage of them either in the run game, which he'll get some yards. He won't get as many as Bryce Young, but he'll get some yards and, and take advantage of outside throws because I think that their secondary can also be had. All right, so before we get into the into the Georgia scouting report, Al, because I know you've scout, scouted them thoroughly. Generally speaking, one of the things that you, even a novice observer would say is you got to try to get outside on this team. I mean, they are stout between the tackles, stout. Jordan Davis is going to be a first-round draft pick. They say he's 340. Uh, you know, when they when they feel a little more honest, they say he's 360. And that's not even honest. He's like 6'6", 375, a man mountain in the middle. But he gets tired, right? He gets gas. Can you get to the perimeter on this team? And then so I said, hey, they, they got to focus on trying to get outside. And somebody's, oh, well, we've been saying it all year. They should have been running outside from the beginning of the season. Al, they have, we've talked about this over and over again. They have some plays that wind up hitting outside, or may, maybe not necessarily designed to do that, but have some plays that hit outside. Then they throw in some reverses, some pin and pulls, right? They get outside a little bit, stretch here and there, but that's not their staple. Then later in the season, some of those some of those plays that are designed to hit outside, their stretch plays, their their outside zone action that started to hit. Why is that? Why was that? Did they was it more of the emphasis? And why can't you just run everything from the beginning of the season? Well, they you got to identify yourself somehow, right? And that they identified themselves as, as a power downhill running team. Initially, early in the year, they were a split zone team, mm-hmm. but the split zone kind of got kicked to the back burner a little bit. It never died. It's still there, and they'll run a few again. But they became more of a downhill counter team with variations of guys pulling, whether it was the H pulling or the tackling guard pulling or the center pulling versus a three technique or the guard pulling versus a G. I mean, that was their identity. They were going to run that play anywhere from eight to 12 times a game, maybe more if they weren't defending it. And everything kind of came off that idea. That's how they changed as the season went on. But what they did is they dabbled into the stretch pool a little bit, you know, and they Uh started running some stretch plays and if you look at their efficiency on that play, it's very good. It's very good. And understand the stretch play. Is it necessarily an outside play? And more often than not, does not go around the end. Uh-huh. Usually comes under the tight end after the second level's moved, okay? So I think it's a play in this game. Since they've run it and they had success, the one play that shows up the most against Georgia is a split stretch play. Every team on their schedule run this around this play. 
and to a certain amount of success. Why the split stretch? Why not just the lead stretch? Why not just the open stretch? Right? So let's 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 pause a beat and we will have you detail that that play specifically and why it's effective or why it has had some, you know, some semblance of effectiveness from team to team after you give us the scouting report. So tell us what Georgia is, what their strengths are when you say when you watch them when you break down their schemes, what do you see from the Bulldogs? Well, where Michigan is so good outside with Aiden and Ajabo, they are so good inside with Jordan Davis and Devontae Wyatt. Those two players are stout. I mean, stout. Now, Jordan's obviously kind of a man mountain. And as I said, I talked to you about before, any single block on 99 is a loser. He's going to push it or he's going to run around it because he has quickness. He's not just a big dude in there. He has quickness. But – he plays a position where you can double him a lot. So it's not a huge issue. Their defensive ends, Trayvon Walker and Nolan Smith, are good players. They're not the caliber of the Michigan defensive ends, but they are good players. The strength where really they raise hell, what gives you probably as much headache, is because their inside guys are so stout, their linebackers are going to run free. Yeah. Free. Yeah, you got – and and uh, Trey Walker is a very good player – and Nicobe Dean is an excellent player, yeah. but both of them are bullets. I mean, they're sideline to sideline. The whole idea of their defense is to get them free with by eating up blocks up front. You know what I mean? They just you eat up eat up double teams and the linebackers. You can't get to the speed of their linebackers. So, but in their secondary, they're good. They're a you know they're a to me a B minus second. They're they're good. They're not great. Okay, but a lot of times they're covered. By good pass rush, by, you know, a lot of times they don't have to cover a long time, you know, and they'll pressure enough so that, you know, they will. Mm -hmm. Although they, unlike a lot of teams, are not dependent on a lot of line charge variation and blitzes because they're stout enough to play stationary and still play good defense. They play in a four shell Mm -hmm. uh, damn near every snap. And that's been it, it was that way for the entire season? Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Pretty much. Now occasionally they'll they'll mix that, but pretty much a four shell. They play with a four two look and will mix in odd looks and put Jordan Davis over the center. Uh-huh. You will get a lot less odd looks than you'll get four two looks. But more often than not, there's always two linebackers inside the core of the defense unless you empty the formation, in which case obviously they got to cover down and there may only be one linebacker in there. But they're going to pressure enough early downs, and they'll do what I call pops. They'll pop one linebacker and then slant away from that pop just so they get a little movement in there, okay? Occasionally, they'll, they'll blitz both linebackers, what we call a barrel cross, mm-hmm. and drop their defensive ends. They're, they'll From their force shell, they'll rotate safeties down into the box to play the run. They will sell them, put a safety down on a pre-stamp like Penn State would, mm-hmm. just say, hey, run the ball on us. Run the ball on us. I mean, they will come from depth more often, and it's not real deep, but from depth to get that safety involved in the run. They're going to play their cover four. They will play variations of cover four. It's Nick Saban's defense, pretty much, mm-hmm. okay, where they cut play a coverage called mini, where they'll play cover four to a, a three-by-one formation. They'll walk their star out. Their star is their nickel guy, mm-hmm. uh, Latavius uh I believe it's Latavius uh, Brini, okay, uh, number 36. You'll see him all over. So, but it's very similar to Michigan's defense, very similar, but the strong players are in a different spot, okay? But it's 4 2 3, three, uh, three 4, just like Michigan, four shell rotations, a little bit of man to man mixed in, and will seldom play zero coverage and leave the middle of the field open, almost never. Mm-hmm. So, Devin, you mentioned, and I want you to talk about the vulnerabilities that you you saw in their defensive scheme versus Bama before we get to that. And, and assuming that they play the same way versus Michigan, Devin, I have you sort of sort of script how you attack it. But did you see any differences in the way they tried to defend Bama versus, I mean, did they go outside of themselves in that game? Because that was the contention of some of the Georgia people, that they came out with – with some schemes against Bama that they hadn't really run this season. And that's why they got beat so handily. And I'm, I'm not hearing that from, from you out. It sounds like you don't think they did a whole lot no. different than that. No, game. they got balls thrown over their head. That's number one. I mean, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't any schematic deal. They got and a couple of times, uh, Bryce Young moved out of the pocket and had an improv play that they didn't cover. And he turned it into a big play. 
Uh, but I didn't see any drastic disparity between how they played schematically against Alabama because I charted that game. I put every defense down, and it looked, you know, they'll, the plan may be a little different here, right. a little bit, but they're still in a four shell, rotating safeties, playing some cover four, playing some many, playing some three deep, doing yeah. the pressure package. I mean, nothing that jumped out where you'd say, oh, this is really different than what they've been doing. So, you, know, you know, the one thing I saw uh, that I think really hurt them and, and maybe what their fans are talking about, when they pressure, Bryce Young knew where to go with the ball. All right? Mm-hmm. So when you pressure and the quarterback burns you, that is you do not want to pressure anymore, right? You you can't do it. And then when they when they brought they got they tried to get pressure with, with just four rushing four, he would get out he could get out of the pocket if they got in or whatever. And so they started to do a, a, what we call a must rush, right? Where they're just rushing, but they're not actually rushing, right? They're rushing and just trying to keep contained. And it's almost like, hey, force force him to throw the ball as if he's not a good passer. And he torched them in that way too. You know what I mean? It, the one play I think everybody remembers, he's sitting in the pocket, and instead of scrambling out. He stays in the pocket for, I mean, a 10 seconds might be too much, but it was a very long time, and he directs the scramble drill from within the pocket. I'm, I've never seen, a, a, especially a young quarterback, have the poise to be able to stay within the pocket, knowing that he's not truly being rushed, and direct a, a scramble drill, right, without scrambling, right? And so when you do things like that, that that makes you get outside of yourself as a defense, as a defensive coordinator. It's like there's no answers for this kid, you know what I mean? And so I think that's something that, that they might have been – you know, alluding to as as a fan base is like, man, we just didn't look like the same team. But that wasn't because of the scheme. That was because that other that player on that other team made you look like that. So let's talk about the passing game, and then we'll work our way up to the to the run game, the split stretch. Uh, in a second, Devin mm. K. McNamara is going to play 75, 80 percent of these snaps at least, right? So he's mm. he's your quarterback. So a lot of fans are saying, well, hey. He just has to do what Bryce Young did. Now, I, you hope. <laughs> Devin, 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 I'm just giving you what the fans Oh, they can see my face. Oh, God. I'm give, yes, they can see your face. I'm giving you what the fans are saying. Now, well, hey, he threw 400 plus shots. This is how you got to beat him. When that is, you can hope for that. I'm saying you can hope for that. And if it happens, you celebrate it. Man, that's an amazing performance. But as... The, the coaching staff, they can't plan that. They can't plan that, right? But you are, to the fans' point, going to need more in this game than you get typically in the throw game. So how do you expect or how can K. McNamara, assuming they come out in the same way that they came out against Bama, how can, how do you see him being effective against that sort of, that sort of scheme, that sort of strategy? The one thing that I think Georgia will do, this I think that they will – they will get up in the receivers' faces, right, and force perfect throws because it, it, as much as, you know, you would think like, oh, well, he's not a good runner, but he's just super accurate. He hasn't been super accurate. He's been he's been ac- inaccurate in a lot of different spots. And so I think that they will they will make a make it a point to reroute and, and get in the face of the receivers. But on the backside, they tend to leave guys very, very soft, right, so to the field, right? And, and, and I think they'll do that even more. Than, than they usually do just because of the, the arm strength of, of, of McNamara and, and him not being able to have, have it proven that he can make those backside throws. So I think that uh, we're going to have to use we, – we've run the bench quite a bit, right, with timing routes, and our receivers have learned really how to run routes and get open, and we're going to have to do that. It's going to be ha- based off of timing because uh, Cade hasn't shown that he's going to drop back and read the defense and, and dice everybody up like everybody wants him to do. But he has shown that he can make t- throws on time when he knows where he's going with the ball. All right, so I think it's going to be up to Gaddis to make sure he devises a plan to not isolate Cornelius Jones, right? Get him on one-on-one routes and, and create one-on-ones for him so that he can run and, and make plays. And, and the more he does that, the more he loosens up, maybe uh, Georgia will dedicate an extra guy over there and then it'll open up the middle of the field a little more and, and give a little few more opportunities. So, uh, you know, when he says – they come out and they, they're giving you a lot of two man looks. Uh, Al, I'm I'm thinking tight ends in the middle of the field. I'm thinking, I'm thinking there's going to be some, especially with how much their linebackers are going to react to run. It feels like this is a game that Eric All and Mike Schumacher could maybe have some some effectiveness in the middle of the field. Give me give me your attack scheme or your attack plan if you see in the passing game. If you see the the deployment that you saw against uh, the Georgia defense, like they deployed against Bama, 
yeah, if they're playing man to man, you're going to get some multiple crossing routes because they have it in their offense. They'll do it. You, you're going to get some picks, some rub routes, those types of things, which Michigan has used. Uh, I think Devin's right. I think they got it. They got to use some quick rhythm throws. That's what he's best at. Right. That's his back. He is. He is a. He is not a bad downfield thrower. Thrower if he gets man to man coverage. He's not as good against zone, but what he does do well against zone is he picks at the underneath guys, slants, sticks, things like that, smash routes. He can get rid of the football and and do some things on some early downs in particular, I think, just have change moves. Because you got to understand in this game, I think both defenses are thinking the same. I think Georgia and Michigan are saying, we're going to make the quarterback beat us. We mm-hmm. can't get the ball run on us. Mm-hmm. I bet you Michigan's thinking the same thing about Stetson Bennett. So if the quarterback's got to beat you, you got to get things the quarterback can do well. And I think the things that Cade does well is the quick rhythm throws, some play passes, again, knowing that not all your shots are going to hit, but if just some of those bombs land, it may be enough to win the game. But yeah. I think that's that's Cade McNamara. And I think anything out of that realm is going to be asking him to do something that I don't think he's as good at. He's got to yeah. hit some – he got to hit a few shots, though. Oh, no doubt. It, in I, this game. I told you the other day on the radio is he doesn't have to hit them all, mm-hmm. okay? He doesn't have to do what Bryce Young did because I'm telling you what's not being talked about enough is that Georgia's offense is going to be challenged by defense, uh, Michigan's defense. They're mm-hmm. going to have to score points to win this game, okay? And I'm not 100% sure they're going to. That being said is does he need to score 40 points to beat Georgia? I don't think he does. Just my opinion. I think what he's got to do is hit enough shots, not necessarily 400 yards passing, hit his quick rhythm throws, run the ball respectably, take care of it like they have going into this game. And they get, that, to me, is the formula for winning the game. Yeah, little known stat, Devin. Michigan leads the country in plays. Of 50 awesome yards. plays. Yeah, yeah. Man, that's incredible, which tells you something. Maybe it's not as bad as everybody thinks. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's some long runs in there. (laughs) Devin cannot help himself. All right, so so Al Borges, now let's start talking about the run game Uh, because everyone knows this is the staple for Michigan. This is what their success is predicated on. This is how those shots that we've seen Cade hit, these are how those shots are set up. I mean, they are. there's a gross overreaction to Michigan's run game. Against this team. Coach Borges. Uh, Coach Borges, what if we had a run game like this back out when I love to do all that play action <laughs> in that 65 waggle? Coach oh, Borges, no, no. What, what did you – I mean, Coach I think- Borges, I mean, how about a run game like this off of 65 waggle with, with a backside comeback or or uh, dig touchdown, all, all these things. I mean, we did it. With no run game, with me as the run game, essentially. The, the best games we played is when we had some run game. You know, we yeah. think about it. When we yeah. had some run game, was 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 the best games we played. But you know what I found, coordinating thirty years, it's so weird. Is some years it's just harder than hell to run the ball, mm. and other years you go, God, we run the crap out of the ball. You know, I I can't, and and you keep trying, and you're stubborn because if you're not stubborn, you're never going to run the ball. You got to be yeah. somewhat stubborn. But there is a point. And I heard Ernie Zampezi say this years ago, Chargers coordinator with Fouts mm-hmm. and them. He goes, when he went to the Rams, he could run the ball. With the Chargers, their strength was let Dan Fouts throw it. We weren't, we weren't really a running team. And I learned, I said, you know, some years it's just hard and you got to know, okay, maybe we're not going to be as good a running team. Maybe we got to throw the ball to score points. And the problem with that is your quarterback gets beat up. And, th- and that's the biggest issue with it, and particularly – with the year Devin played, he's talking about our inside three players were really inexperienced. We had good tackles, good tackles, but we had great tackles. tackles. Yeah, um, really good tackles, but we just weren't experienced inside. And that's where they were getting after us, you know, the middle pocket push, the blitzes and such. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's no question. If you can run the ball, those play passes look beautiful. Why? Because you, the whole core comes up. And they give you all those layered routes that you can throw behind them. They're easy to read, right? Rather than drop back and try to read the buzz and see where they're going. On a play pass, they all come running up because they're scared you're going to run on them. And mm-hmm. all those levels, those those post routes, safeties come up, those those deep ends and break ins, the, the, the linebackers come up, and they're just wide open. They're no-brainers for the quarterback. So, and, then, uh, and then if they can't cover that, if they do cover all that, right, they're, they're turning their backs, running to go get it. 
And guess what? I'm just going to run for 15 to 20 yards at, at the least. That's a, that's yeah. where it's, that's the least is going to happen is I'm going to get 15 to 20 yards. And Which then they're going to be devastated. Now, that, that's the added dimension that he brought to the table to it. And the problem with him is later in the year, he was so beat up mm. that he didn't run like he used to run. At the beginning of the year, he's killing everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. And by the end of the year, he's limping into the end zone against Ohio State. You know, so uh, – but that's kind of the residuals of, of playing the position. You know, I, I told you this, Sam, and Devin knows it because I've heard him talk about it. He understands is there's a cost to drop back passing. There's a cost. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's hits on the quarterback and things like that. And and But if you're going to play the position right, you got to do things that you don't necessarily aren't that much fun. Yeah. Right, right. All right, so how do you run the football on this team, Al? Understanding that it's probably going to be not as not as potent your attack against this defense that has uh, has been against others, but that also means, and I've said this, you can't concede it, right? You no. you got to still well, particularly if that's your deal. That's their deal, right? So you got to run to gain respect, right? Run to gain respect, so you can do all the other stuff. And then if for some reason you find a little leak in the in in the in the in the dam. Sometimes it pops open and you can run better than you thought you could. So when I just looking at him, and I've already talked a little bit about this, is the split stretch is the one play everybody runs on, every team they play. I mean, literally. Why? Because it's outside, kind of, kind of outside. I mean, it starts outside. It comes under a lot. Mm -hmm. If you study the tapes, it comes under more than it goes outside. But it gets a moving. Why the split? Why not just run the stretch? Split action slows down the backside linebacker. Mm -hmm. He's afraid of a, of, a, of, a, of a naked boot, okay, coming back the other direction. So he doesn't move as fast. So now all of a sudden, instead of N'Kobe Dean blowing to the ball as fast as he can go, he's got to be a little more apprehensive. Now your backside tackle and guard got a chance to cut him off. So but what I just heard there, I'm sure you heard that Devin heard it too. I'm surprised he didn't blurt this out, but he said, they're scared of the naked boot. Mm. If JJ's at quarterback. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, get to that in a minute because that that's that's again that's got to be part of the deal mm -hmm. now. To, in, you know, just in my opinion, um, but the split stretch is the play that jumps out the most. You don't, you know, counter plays is the best play that Michigan runs. You don't find many successful counters on tape. I, boy, believe me, I watch closely mm -hmm. trying to find some some counters that hit, and they they not many. That doesn't mean Michigan can't, but most teams haven't. And a lot of times, like I said. You keep chipping at the rock, and all of a sudden in the third quarter, a counter hits. Ooh, wait a minute. They might be a little tired, or they might be a little demoralized or something. You know what I mean? The game's mm -hmm. close. We're not, they're not getting us three and out every time, and that's the key is they can't be three and out all the time. That way they can use J.J. If they're, not th if they're three and out too much, J.J. will play very little in this game. But if they, can, if they can keep their normal offense in there, okay, and then mix in J.J. McCarthy, zone reads, okay, uh, Quarterback draws, okay, because they're not going to play two man on him, but they will. If you look at how they handle empty looks and motion to empty looks, there's some juicy boxes in there to run some quarterback draws. Okay, that's yeah. not bad. The OT counter, Devin, remember this one early in the year where he'd, he'd, he'd read that end off the counter OT play, yeah, and, and either hand it to the guy going around the edge or pull it out and run the OT himself. Perfect yep. for these guys because a straight OT counter. I'm not sure, but an OT read where the core is not just running to the ball, a mm -hmm. little different deal. And then, and Josh is good at this, devise a couple of pass plays that look like those plays. Now, for example, he did one one game where they they ran uh, uh, kind of a split flow type deal, and he had he had um, 14 um, Roman Roman mm -hmm. Wilson kind of fake a block on the on the on the on the corner and take off. The guy came running up knowing nine was in the game. Now, remember, there's two different defenses now, the defense defending number 12 and the defense defending number nine. And Kirby Smart, I know because I coach against Kirby, he will have periods of just number nine. Okay, nine's in the game. These are the defenses I'm going to call. These are the plays we think he's going to run, and they will be. But if you have a couple of counter punches that he hasn't seen or they haven't seen, I think that will bode well. Michigan with regard to getting a couple of big plays in there when he's in the game. You know, one thing I've noticed in Devin, you and media probably haven't have noticed this as well. It, the, the, the fan perception of the game and how it's shaped fans look at games, play to play, play to play. Oh, that didn't work. Why did you run it? Don't run it again. Coaches look at it. Series to series, quarter to quarter, yeah. half to half. 
And the long game. Play. Yeah, the long game. You run plays to set up other plays. So even the plays that fail have a function. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking about in the Iowa game where Michigan, the counter was getting blown up. Blown up the whole game. I don't know if there's a successful counter the whole game. But he ran mm-hmm. it still like four or five times. And then that last time they gave some action, you get Eric all in the wheel round. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that's Think about the series, the series you said. We're going to run uh, five counters and one counter pass, which in that case was a counter leaf flicker, which fooled mm-hmm. the corner. Well, you ran five counters, you had, got two yards, maybe an average, and then all of a sudden you hit an 80-yard touchdown or 70-yard touchdown on a counter pass. What Perfect. is the sum total of that series? Probably about six to seven yards of play, right? Yeah. But in the interim, the fans were screaming your name with a cuss word in front of you, you know? <laughs> what are you running the ball up the middle? What do you keep running? Well, oh, my goodness. There was a residual effect to the failed play. And that's what's yeah. really hard for the, for, the, for the layman watching the game is they don't understand the, 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 the residual effects of a failed play. Now, if everything fails, it's on you. But eventually, if you're just patient enough, a lot of times – some of those plays that weren't very good will pay off in the end with either a counter punch or just wearing them down and being able to run that play. Yeah. You know, you know what I think, Coach Borges. Is, uh, you remember the the play we used to run where we would we would put the the three technique or, or the nose in the, in the read game. I think they need to do that two to three times, and that will slow Davis down. Where they got JJ McCarthy in there, you put him in there, you don't block him, right? Let him come through, and you read him, and and he's going to be so confused. Because I haven't seen them do – I haven't seen a team do that to them all year, right? And so those interior guys just aren't used to reading it. You don't have to do it a bunch, but do it one time or two times, and that will make him think, right? And so like I said earlier, thinking is not their strong suit. Not not they're not smart guys. It's just that they're so used to just playing fast and playing within the, the scheme that is relatively simple because they're talented. You get this big guy thinking, and so now some of those one-on-one blocks that aren't aren't possible, I think those one-on-one blocks can be possible now because he's not just going with his hair on fire and playing football the way he's used to it. He's thinking about, oh, are they reading me? Do I do I need to make sure I read the the, the back coming through, or is the run, or is the quarterback going to replace, or, or or different things like that? Yeah, creating apprehension, creating conflict, right? Creating yeah. conflict. This it could be several different things when this happens. Something that I I think would be a great idea. He's always going to be the right defensive tackle. Okay, mm-hmm. he will play nose or he will play three, either one. Okay, he doesn't really flip sides unless there's some personnel switch but Mm -hmm. he's the right tackle if you set your tight end up to his side he's usually going to be in a three technique okay Mm -hmm. there's a pretty good bet of that i trap him i trap him i'd find a way trap somehow some way get into the get quorum and haskins in the backfield at the same time and if he's lined up to the right trap him to the right and hand the ball to haskins if he's to the left trap him to the left hand the ball to quorum I just think it's another thing, and it goes right with what he's talking about, Sam. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, it's creating some conflict for the kid. One time, the guy pass sets on me, and I get ear holed by a pulling guard. Okay, now that pulling guard might bounce off him. I don't know. Yeah, but it's something else he's got to think about. See, so Michigan, they don't. I mean, Harbaugh is like the trap is in his DNA, right? We don't really see this team do it a whole lot, but you got a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Between your life. So That's you the only reason I'm even proposing that this so, is a lot of time. And I mentioned this to you. I remember 2011, San Francisco 49ers versus the Detroit Lions. Jim Harbaugh's first season with the with the Niners. They come in. Detroit, I mean, they're Detroit's a a, a team that's on the in on the ascent. You got Indomitian Sue in his second season, and he is wrecking run games, mm-hmm. wrecking them. Jim Harbaugh wants to run the football. You're not going to run it on Indomitian Sue, Stephen Tuckler. I mean, you're not going to run it on them. They ran it down the Lions' throats. And you know how they did it, Al Borges? They trapped the hell out of Indomitian Sue. I don't know. He had two tackles the whole game. I mean, and Frank Gore rushed for like 150 yards in that contest. It was a trap clinic. If Jim Harbaugh, this is the same Jim Harbaugh that coached that team that day against a hell of a, a hell of a defensive tackle that no one could single block, and he figured out a way to run the football. In fact, you gotta believe that he'll go back into his mental roller deck, so to speak. Say, hey, Josh, hey man, 
guess what? Why, why don't we spring a couple of these on this big fella? Yeah, Q, if you keep it simple now, keep it simple. See, because I know we put a trap in for the Sugar Bowl when I was at Auburn, okay? Uh, and they had a guy like three technique that was a booger. You know, he was going to give you a problem. And we said, we're going to just trap the three technique. Everybody's going to block the same guys. If we don't get the front, we're going to audible out of the play, okay? And I'll be damned. We I ran a trap. I think second or third play of the game, hit 34 yards. It was the longest run of the whole game. So, I mean, it's not their nature. It's right. not a play. But since you have a little more time, and you're not doing that with maybe just one play. I'm going to do it one play. I'm not changing our run game for these guys because it'll then they're, they're dictating us too much. But for one, one play, one shot at it, and what it could give you, not just on the play, but the residual effects of the kid just having to play with a little more apprehension might be worth it. See, and to me, this is – so I'm going to call that one of the – it's not a trick play, but it's it's sort of outside of yeah. Of the, equi- like, so I call yeah. it equipment for your offense. It's just equipment for your offense. It's not it's not the nucleus of what you do, but it's just equipment for your offense because you do have a guy that's uh, that's a disruptor that needs to be dealt with. One of the things that Josh Gaddis has done so well, I'm talking about clinics, he has run a clinic on how to take a play and make it look different. Every time you run, and really, it has been most obvious, probably to fans, because you could you could point it out and how they run counters, right? I mean, but how it's maybe been most obvious to fans is in these trick plays. Every all flea flickers aren't created the same. Al Borges, he's made the flea flicker look different. Yeah, and that's um, it, I, I would never guess you could run a flea flicker every game. I mean, we ran one maybe <laughs> twice a year. <laughs> you, yeah, you, once or twice a year. He's oh, running away every game. I can't, and it works. I mean, there's something to that now. There's something to that. And I told I told Sam, I said, what's a flea flicker? It's just a play action pass on steroids, right? Yep. It. It's, yep. it's just a, it looks so much like the run because it's going in the line. You're flipping the ball back before the safeties have figured that out. They all come blowing up. Just change the look. Run a different flea flicker. I never thought to do that, but mm-hmm. uh, I want to see their flea flicker cut up at the end of the year because I promise you it's impressive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's fun to watch too. And, and the thing is, they do it so much, it's not a trick play anymore for them. Oh, right? I know. It's, it's, it's within awesome. the framework of the defense, right? Yeah. They have their reverses. They have, These are all things that help in their run game and that they run every week. So just think about as a defensive coordinator preparing for it, right? You got to prepare for all the run inside, all the basic stuff they do, but you got to prepare. When are they going to run this flea flicker? Because we know it's coming, right? So we can't continue to blow our guys up in, into the line of scrimmage. When are gonna, when are they going to run these two or three reverses, right? When are they going to throw this, run this throwback pass? Like it's so much different. And now they got a little more extra time, right? And so, it, or they can go in this game and don't run those things. But the fact that the defensive coordinator has to think about it, has to waste time preparing for it, is huge for, for Michigan's uh, chances in this game. You think yeah. we see bluff runs in this game? Man? Absolutely, but it will, it'll be with nine in there. And they'll find different ways. One play they've shown a lot of vulnerability to. Uh, probably number two to the split stretch is to line up in quads looks with four receivers to the field and the tight end attached and run the bluff run back the other way where they overload the defense. They put everybody to the field side, and they leave one guy back and then just bring that tight end back and either run. I've seen two plays, and they're perfect for J.J. You run a bluff run back away from the quad side or run a counter play with a lead back. You think? Do you think, would you, I'm putting you in the shoes, would you let him RPO it? Because you know with that first year, Josh's first year, that bluff RPO, he, I mean, that was like a high percentage play for them. In the red zone. I mean, they scored off of it a lot, it seemed. Like, I don't have the chart in front of me. I just remember us detailing it so yeah. many times. And, I, you know, that's putting a little more decision-making yeah, in the youngster's no, but, hands. But yeah, it, I, I would, if I were them, again, I would not go crazy on RPOs, but they still have them now. It's not like they're gone. He didn't throw them out of the offense. And this kid is built for RPOs. I mean, he's, because he can throw on a run, he can throw it the with his with his body in a lot of different positions, arm angles. Oh, that see, that's key. He knows. He knows. RPOs. You don't get. It ain't always fundamentally pretty. I because I he, he knows how I coach a quarterback, and I want that step to the throw, drive the throw, do all that. Well, when I call an RPO, I used to have to hold my nose <laughs> to watch. Go, just get that sucker off. Just get it off, and they'd be throwing it. But 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 they were worth it because so often you got so many jerks on the defense. They were leaving guys wide open. So if you could just, you know, putz it out there. Find a way. 
Yeah, find a way to get it out there. And, but that that's RPOs. You got you got to get away from your purity as a, as a quarterback coach a little bit. Drove me nuts, but it was worth it at the end of the day if the quarterback was capable. But you can see Sam why some guys aren't great RPO quarterbacks uh-huh. because some guys aren't built to do that. They need well, to have their feet in line. They need to do all those things to make the throws. And in yeah, RPO, you just yeah. it's not it's pretty. You can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Would you? So um, this is to both of you guys. Would you tempo these guys? And if oh, without who, question, without a doubt, without a doubt. Now, now, and not the whole game, but sprinkled no. in for sure. Because you know what they're going to say. Everybody's going to say well, they're they're not good at tempo. They'll go, well, it, tempo's not completely foreign to Michigan. They've done some tempo stuff. Yeah. They're not a tempo team. But why not? Why not? There's nothing wrong strategically with throwing some fast offense in there occasionally. Mm -hmm. And again, it wears them out. That's the big thing. It wears them out. Here's another question to that same point. Not necessarily tempo, but you you remember we were talking about the Michigan State game, how, and I talked to his Vance that was talking about this. He said, you got to come up with a, a, a scheme that, you you could run a bunch of defenses from that or or a, a lineup a personnel grouping that you can run a bunch of different defenses from and feel comfortable, but not substituting. And I wonder in this game, even if even when you aren't tempo and are you do you get into a habit of, of maybe not subbing as much, so you're keeping their guy keeping guys like Jordan. Yeah, Davis you don't, field you don't want more. tempo if you're gonna sub. Don't, don't even bother with it if you're gonna. Sub. Yeah, because they hold them up. They hold yeah. them up. You lose the effectiveness of the tempo. But what, what they'll do, again, I know Kirby Smart, and Kirby Smart's a, a Kevin Steele guy, and I work with Kevin and coach against Kevin. Is they will have – they handle tempo with one one call. They'll say green, blue, and that tells you the front, the coverage, the whole thing. Now, that's communicatively good. That's mm-hmm. the kids – but it doesn't keep them from fatiguing. And if you can run two, three, four, and make them keep the guys on the field that you want to get tired – I think there's something to it. Do it twice and a half. You don't have to do it whole game. Do it twice and a half, and I think there's something to that against this team. All right. So, so Devin, I need you to handicap this game. How do you think it's going to play out? And uh, I'm sure you've watched the other side of the ball too. So I'm, I'm, I want you to talk about how you think the attack plan is going to go, but how you also think they're going to defend them. How do you think this game is going to play out? Give me the Devin Gardner sort of forecast for the semifinal matchup between Michigan and Georgia. I think uh, I think some I think fans are going to be a little disappointed because I think that in the beginning of the game, Michigan is going to be relatively passive in their approach just because Georgia's offense won't be able to do anything. Right. And I think that they're going to make sure that they do stay away from mistakes and stay away from the drop back pass where you get guys running and and hitting the quarterback in the back and, and creating turnover situations. And they're going to kind of be beating their head early against a brick wall, right? And, and like we talked about, though, that's not all bad just because of the the propensity they've shown to use the play off of the play, right? We've done a great job of having a play, run a play. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And then a play off of that play that creates an explosive play. And so I think the early onset of the game is going to be very um, almost boring to watch because I do not think Georgia's offense is going to be nearly explosive enough to create plays. And I think they're going to go in the same way. And I think this is going to be a defensive struggle type of battle. But I think when you mix in some of those RPOs and, and some of those some of that J.J. McCarthy, that's going to really loosen up the Georgia defense and it's going to put Michigan in a power position. And I think on the other side, it's going to force the other quarterback to make more mistakes. And, and it's going to put Michigan in position, have good field position, which they're going to be able to capitalize on. And, and I think that's what's going to help them win the game. I think this is going to be a defensive game for sure. So, Al, you – you saw different notes in different games mm-hmm. that you feel like draw from Michigan's wheelhouse. So take me through what you picked out from game to game that fits into Michigan's arsenal. And how do you see it being applied in this game? Uh, bluff zones with uh, the JJ package. Again, I, I seven to 10 plays, uh, some form of bluff zone, whether it's in quads, whether it's in diamond look, which they've shown, mm-hmm. uh, I think would really be good. Uh, some quarterback draw somewhere near hit them with a quarterback draw. And and because uh, he has a good feel for finding the holes mm-hmm. in the defense. I think that's one. I think uh, some form of quarterback counter, whether it's counter read or just pure quarterback counter where he can make the read which would help them get the ball outside if their ends close or just pull the ball down and take off. It's what's good about the plays. It's got 
two good facets to it. You can hand, hand it to either Corum or Haskins around the edge, or he can pull it. You got him carrying the ball with good athletic linemen pulling. I think uh, uh, trapping mm-hmm. again. I think uh, throwing just that one novelty play in there because ne- Josh is going to have some stuff now. He's going to have some whacked out reverse. For him, okay, <laughs> they, they had never seen before. <laughs> right, the, that's the other one that he read. Uh, 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 I love ways. watching their reverses because it's always something different, you know. Yeah. And he'll have some whacked out reverse, maybe two, maybe even three. Hell, he got a lot of time, so you you never know. He's going to have something like that. And then in the base run game, do what you do. Do what you do, knowing that it could be like Devin's saying now. It's hard to run the ball into a fresh, fired-up defense that's really good. That's not easy to do. So, But you can't give up on what's brought you to the dance. So you got to do some of that, maybe a little bit of fly action and a fly to, to, to Henning, I think, somewhere. That's shown up in a couple games is they have been structurally in bad position to wipe out. I'm sorry? Edwards as well. He has to be, yeah, he has to be a player in that. Now he's we have mentioned him. We have mm-hmm. mentioned him. He's another one now that has to have a little six to seven play package of either getting him the ball or decoying with him because the decoy plays have been every bit as yeah. good as the as the plays that go to him, you know, where they're just pretending like they're gonna throw it to him and they get gross reactions from the defense. Because mm-hmm. what are they gonna say, Devin, when seven comes in the game? <laughs> Seven's in the game, seven's in the game. Hey, make sure we know where he is. You know where he, know where he is. And they're probably gonna throw him a pass. Or at least look like they're going to throw him a pass. But mm-hmm. it isn't predictable every time that he's going to get a ball. So you can use other guys off of seven being in the game. So, you know, we got all the answers here because we don't have to call the plays, <laughs> which is kind of nice because I was the guy taking all the hits for you. But there and is I was, you, were taking, you were taking the, 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 the hits. And you hits. Were taking the real I was taking the real hits, yes. We figured out <laughs> the actual hits. So it's, it feels good to be on this side and just, hey, <laughs> this is what they should do, and it should work. Yeah, but they yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah. Do so I mean, don't know what they're doing. I, I always said, God, I can't wait till I retire. I can sit in Section 6 and have all the answers, you know. But uh, but I just I think, you know, I had to told Sam this the other day. They're talking. I keep hearing it. Uh, Michigan's in over oh, they're, they're their head. Boy, they got their hands full. Georgia has their hands full now. Yeah. Georgia's got a lot more stuff to think about mm-hmm. than, than Michigan has because – Two quarterbacks can play. They have been different skill sets. They get, they can hit you. You talk about speed. You got Edwards as a receiver. You got Henning as a reverse guy. You got f- solid receivers outside. This has been the nicest thing for Michigan. They lost uh, Ronnie Bell early, and I thought that was going to be a huge. It really hasn't turned out to be near the hit I thought it was going to be because the receivers have stepped to the plate. And if Cade can just do what he's doing, we, you know what you have with Cade McNamara. You keep him in that box, and he does what he does. And does it with consistency, mix in JJ, they can win this game. This team is not invincible, but it ain't gonna be easy, but it's doable. Yeah, man. He uh as an offense, I mean, every every phase of it, Kate McNamara has gotten better as the season has gone on. JJ McCarthy's really settled in. That offensive line, they won the Joe Moore Award. I mean, I I watched a a preview. From a Georgia perspective, they said how they won the Joe Moore Award, but they don't have ass kickers on the offensive line. I'm like, man, these dudes. <laughs> like, they really think that they are about to bum rush Michigan. It's like, I, they, they won the award for the best offensive line in the country, but they don't have any ass kickers up front. Like, wow. Well, they're going to wow. find out the first time they drop back pass on a pure passing situation that they're in a new ball game. Okay. They're in a new ball game because. On the other side of the ball, which we're not talking about today, as we speak, they're figure, trying to figure ways out to either turn to Hutchinson. Oh, God, if we turn to Hutchinson, then we single up our right tackle on a job. Well, we can't really do that every time. Oh, let's chip Hutchinson. Well, then what are we going to do with a job? We'll chip job too. What, we can get nobody out? You know, these are the conversations. They got issues now. They got issues on both sides of the ball that they haven't had to deal with all year. As much as they've, you know, they play in the SEC, and I know all about that, yeah. trust me. They got issues that they haven't had to deal with all year. Well, they so they said, "Hey, we got to stop Will Anderson in the Bama game." Will Anderson still got a sack. They had given up eight sacks for the season heading into that game. Bama got three, and they you know tried to do all that stuff you're talking about with Will Anderson. A couple other guys went off and got sacks and pressured the quarterback. So, I mean, a lot of it has to do. Yeah, with, how many with sacks did Ohio State go after? <laughs> How many they have? I don't know, but I, I, I bet it wasn't many. I bet it wasn't many. But 
uh, and the sacks in that game were nothing like the pressures. Right. And Devin will tell you, he he knows this one as good as he could. Pressures are just as important, maybe it's more bad. important than sacks. That's right, because they forced interceptions. They forced or ill-advised throws, you know. So, yeah, you uh, know what I thought about, Devin? I thought about a story you told when I was watching uh, Aiden, and we uh, we interviewed Chris about this, because Aiden, Chris Hutchinson, his dad wasn't a talker. Aiden Hutchinson, since I've known him, like, sophomore year in high school he talks a lot he doesn't talk in the media as much as he did as a high schooler because i remember covering him at the camp where he went against andrew stuber andrew stuber was a year older than him and maybe 70 pounds on him and he ain't earned his scholarship that day and i talked to him i said i mean i destroyed that dude i destroyed that guy i killed that guy he said it on, on camera in the interview right he doesn't do that anymore in the media but on the field that ohio state game he's like yeah come oh, yeah. on Come on my way. <laughs> you want some? I will give you future, some. A few choice words I sure I'm sure we're told in there that we can't say yeah. on this family network. Yeah, I thought <laughs> I thought about the story you told about the Michigan State game when Danico's Allen came at you and had a oh, few man. things to say to you. Yeah, it was a hey Coach Burns, do you know why that defense was so fired up to tackle me every single play? I don't know, probably because you popped off too much. I don't know. I, I know. didn't pop off. I'm a smart guy. I'm strategic in the way. You know, you remember me in practice. I don't I wasn't ever like that in the game. You were up in the box. I never did that. I helped guys up. I was the I was the cool headed guy. You Cam were, Gordon were, at the coin toss. Remember Cam Gordon at the coin toss? He goes up, doesn't shake their hand, and talks all this junk to him. And so now they're all fired up. And Danico's Allen, the first time he tackled me, says, I'm gonna be in here all day i said i said well all right then that's what i'm talking about that's the kind of game i want yeah he wasn't playing as you know coach borges it was probably quite a struggle up there how can we allow him two seconds to throw the ball remember i will run the ball and i will make two guys miss and then four other guys will be tackling me i mean yeah. it was the most amazing thing that i've ever seen it's like how is this i don't happening? know but you give me a headache i gotta relive this again oh that's terrible that's why Devin, whenever he sees some of these pockets he's like oh man Oh, man, a little dream. You can't throw from that. <laughs> Coach Borges can throw from that. Fortunately, Devin, they have been able to throw throw, throw from that this year to Ish. the point of Big Ten championship, and now they're in the semifinal taking on the Georgia team. Yeah. And I think, I think the entire South, everyone south of the Mason Dixon line, is in for a rude awakening about the Michigan team. They're going to see because the only team up this way that they respect. Is Ohio State, and you would—it's mm -hmm. almost like they didn't watch that game. They didn't watch. It's like, did you forget that we I'm blasted right. them? I'm confused. Right. We blasted right. them. Duh. Wasn't even close. And as much as their quarterback, oh, we had the flu. We had the flu. We were thick. We were thick. I don't want to hear none of that. And that's why you went down to fourth in the Heisman voting because you're, you're you're making excuses here, and you just got your butt kicked. Just take it. Take the butt whooping and move forward. Don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. I mean, Coach Boris, do we make excuses? Yeah, have I oh, ever gotten set up at that podium after getting stuck 100 times and said, yeah, man, I, no, man, I got to do better, man. I got to find a way. We've got to yeah. find a way. Yeah, Taking it. Well, well, you know, hey. it does matter that we were sick. What? <laughs> all right, so now that we have you guys together, because I get this all the time, both of you have talked about it, separate from one another, last play against Ohio State. Last play against Ohio State. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, you remember, I haven't ever talked to you about this, but no, I, mean, I was drunk. Played. I was drunk with 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 pain, and I had no idea I what know. was going on. But you well, I, I I just know we had scored twice on option plays early in the game. Okay, remember the first Heat option? Yeah, I pitched one, I ran one. You pitched one, I ran one. So the final play of the game was I don't even know what we called it. It's been so long, but uh, it was a check. We point. called we call the we call Dilio motion to. Uh, uh, like a back line, line corner, back line dig for uh, yes. and, and he didn't work in the middle. Yes. Okay. But we checked it. If the motion went through and they ran with it, we were going to audible not the speed option back the other way. Mm. Not and option. that was a call. Well, he broke his foot. What's the matter with you, man? You broke your foot. <laughs> but anyway, I'm I, telling I, I, you, because you know. we motioned through and Meyer called timeout. And yeah. I swear to you, I didn't do this, but it went through me. I go, I go to. I almost told Brady, I said, Brady, get Devin on the phone and see, can you run one more speed option? Can you run one more speed option? Just one. But he was gimpy as hell. So I'm going, oh, God. Okay, if, I, if, he, if he 
can't do it and he doesn't make it, it was, I'm the dumbest human being that ever lived, okay? Which I might be anyway. But I said, I ah, will just go with the first call, which generally is pretty good against most of the stuff you'll see. But that didn't work, so I am the dumbest human being that ever lived. No, but, it's not. It's, it doesn't work when you allow their best player to run straight through the middle on a guy with a broken foot. That's when it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, that's that's a problem. But my point is, is, is it was a check play that I took the check off because he was hurt. Uh -huh. And I wish today, because he, knowing him, he would have run one more. He would have, oh, he would not have said no to me. He just said, I said, Jeff, can you run more and more? And this would have been the call. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I could do it. Yeah, I, it would have been like, oh my God. You know? <laughs> but I can do it. I can do it. I should have just let him do it and lost. The thing is, though, they, they would have overreacted to me. Lose a game. You know what I mean? Let him win or lose a game. Don't get anybody else. But I didn't do it. And now I live to regret it. So. Yeah, they would have. I think they would have overreacted to me. I would have pitched it. Fitz would have walked in the end zone for a touchdown. Yeah, it was, but that's the reality. The backstory of that two point conversion went beyond, you know, what happened on the play. So yeah. I was yeah. I was just trying to survive. I was just trying to survive. Oh, I tell you what, the best game I think you played. I mean, that one in Notre Dame, uh unbelievable. I mean like, in Notre Dame. You know, and, and and it was it was in that game you got hit, but you didn't get hit hit as much as you did Notre Dame. Notre Dame you got beat around a little bit more. Yeah. The, the uh the Ohio State game, uh we ran the ball on him. We passed the ball on him. It's a shame it didn't turn out better, but it was uh, really a really good offensive football game. Well, well fellas, this, yeah, was great. This, is, this has been a real, I think, education for the fans. Hopefully, when we reconvene, we're talking about a Michigan team that has advanced to the national championship game. And just a brief side note, you guys have any thoughts on that Cincinnati Alabama game? You, you give Cincinnati any chance no. in this contest? Alabama they're gonna get blasted. Like a grape. <laughs> Ain't even gonna be close. And and the, and the college football playoff is wrong for this because they know what's gonna happen. And they're like, all right, you want a group of five in? Here they go. Oh man, it's gonna get ugly fast. <laughs> I would. I couldn't agree with you more. We could be wrong. I hope that you. Know, I hope I'm kind of wrong. I hope. I hope. I don't. I'm not an Alabama fan. I want to make that clear. Okay? Right. But if I told you I thought Cincinnati had a snowball's chance in hell against them, I'd, I'd be the biggest liar in America. So, All right. Well, hopefully we are talking about a matchup with Michigan, or we can talk about Michigan's chances against them. Been real as always, fellas. There you have it in the books. Al Borges and Devin Gardner. The Michigan Insider Film Breakdown. Well, actually, no film this week. But the preview focused on the offense. We'll be back next week with the breakdown of the game. Until then, thanks for watching.